The debate around assisted suicide receives a lot of input and criticism from many different perspectives, with one of the most common perspectives being religion, specifically, here in the United States, evangelical Christianity. Earlier this year, the Christian apologist Sean McDowell interviewed a woman named Stephanie Gray Connors, who recently wrote a book called Start With What? In this book, Stephanie lays out her arguments against assisted suicide. In the book, as in her interview, she attempts to present secular arguments against assisted suicide, but when confronted with some key counter-arguments, she cannot help but lean on her personal religious convictions for support. This will be a recurring theme throughout this video, and to someone like me who does not share her personal religious views, all this does is highlight the weakness of her actual case, and underscore the fact that her view is ultimately informed by her religion, not by the secular arguments she presents. I decided to make this video because, on a small scale, I think assisted suicide is the only humane option in some circumstances. On a larger scale, I'm making this video because the kind of opposition which Stephanie offers against assisted suicide is a prime example of how religion ruins the game for the rest of us, injecting extra invisible rules into society which are unrelated to or which directly contradict the common ground we otherwise have about how the world works. So, what is assisted suicide, and why do I support it? Many people's pain and suffering can be overcome. Many traumatic injuries can be mentally adapted to, and many people with painful and chronic diseases can still live happily and with a sense of purpose. Other people are not so lucky. Some people suffer from system-wide cancer that eats away at them for months, mutilating their body from the inside, and often causing horrible physical pain until it finally kills them. Cases of bone cancer can cause tiny spikes of bone to erupt, which pierce muscles, nerves, and skin from the inside. Even grimacing at the pain is enough to cause more pain, until the cancer finally kills them. Some people have incurable depression that simply has no viable treatment, or whose treatment can only be applied temporarily. One such person is named Megan, whose depression was so bad that the only effective treatment was to implant electrodes into her brain. She started with the electrodes delivering 4 volts, but over the years, her brain adjusted to the voltage, requiring even more to stave off her depression. As of 2019, she was at 7 volts out of a possible 10.5, at which point the electrodes would begin to damage her brain tissue. These electrodes will likely only stave off her depression for another 6 or 7 years. After that, she's likely to get worse, trending back toward her starting point. Just to put this into perspective, this is how horrible she felt on a particular day when the electrode got switched off as her doctor was reconfiguring it. This is how bad she can get, simply because of the way her brain works. I, oh. Sorry, doctor. <laughs> Did you just feel it? I don't feel very good at all right now. Oh, so something just changed? That's why, because in the process of reconfiguring it, it just temporarily went off. So you really noticed that. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay, hang on a second. Let me get this back to a stable <laughs> setting. And then let's go back to that left side and take a look. Tell me more, like, what's... I'd rather talk about it in private. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, let's take, let's take a break. That's <laughs> fine. An even smaller group of incredibly unlucky people suffer from something called fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, where their bodies replace damaged muscles, tendons, and ligaments with bone. This bone cannot be surgically removed, because the tissue damage involved in surgery just creates even more bone tissue. It's a painful life full of breaking bones that you didn't know you had, which only gets worse. The loss of motion in their joints progresses to the point where patients eventually need to decide if they want to be in a sitting or standing position for the rest of their lives, both while awake and while asleep. Most people with FOP end up dying only after their rib cage becomes rigid and can no longer expand. They suffocate to death because they don't have the lung strength to break their own ribs from the inside. In cases like these, 
where the person's natural death is going to be so horrific it belongs in a Saw movie, I think it is especially justifiable to grant the person a less painful method of death before that happens, if they so desire. And in other, ongoing cases, like incurable depression or any number of chronic pain diseases, I think it's clearly the more humane route to allow a person to die now, rather than forcing them to endure this torture for decades to come, again, if they so desire. I support assisted suicide for cases like these, cases where a person's suffering is so bad that they don't want to live, and where their suffering has no realistic chance of going away, and especially where their suffering may get worse until it kills them in some horrific manner. In cases like these, assisted suicide, in a controlled, supervised manner, is clearly the lesser of two evils. Some people's suffering simply cannot be overcome or mentally accommodated. It is these people who I think should be allowed to die on their own terms, rather than being tortured to death by their own bodies. However, as with any serious medical intervention, this would not be something a person could just do on a whim. Part of the assistance is to evaluate the patient to determine if this really is the only way to end their suffering. Many forms of depression can be treated with novel interventions like transcranial magnetic stimulation. Many traumatic injuries can be overcome with drugs and psychological counseling, even if the patient doesn't think so in the moment. The question of who gets to die this way would largely be a question left to doctors and psychiatrists who are qualified to dispense and withhold options based on their evaluation of their patients. All that being said, I wish it didn't have to come to suicide. I wish that no one would ever be in a position where death was the more appealing option. I wish that everyone could find enough emotional happiness and fulfillment in other areas of their life to offset whatever horrible pain they are enduring. But in some cases, it's just not possible. In some cases, Assisted suicide is clearly the lesser of two evils. Some very unlucky people are living in a nightmare, and they just want it to end. And yet, despite all of this, there are people on this planet who would demand that a person suffering from bone cancer, incurable depression, or FOP should continue to live this way for as long as biologically possible. No matter how unbearable the pain is, no matter how loudly the person screams, no matter how many years of incurable torture they have ahead of them, they need to stay alive until their bodies physically give out. Stephanie Connors is one of these people. You say that suicide should never be assisted. That's the way you phrase it. No exceptions at all. But don't worry, she fully understands what it's like to be in a situation like this, because... My fiancé left me at the altar? And in the spring of 2015, our engagement ended. And I was devastated. I felt like my whole future was bleak and dark that I just said to them on the phone, to my sister and cousin, um, I don't want to live, I want to die. Yeah, this is going to go well. Part 2. Legal Concerns Many opponents of assisted suicide raise concerns about the potential legal issues and about the potential dangers of it being inappropriately administered, such as on disabled people who aren't actually capable of making this decision for themselves. These concerns are real, and they merit a serious discussion. However, I've often found that these concerns are raised in bad faith. If we can't even agree on the basic principle of assisted suicide, even under the most straightforward of circumstances, then questions like these are nothing more than red herrings. And in Stephanie Connor's case, these herrings are as red as Rudolph's nose. Once we legalize assisted suicide, we create a climate where there may be some, for example, old people who request assisted suicide, not because deep down they truly want it, but because their neighbor requested it a year ago and had it. And they think, you know, my neighbor isn't a burden on her family. And I feel like I'm a burden on my family. And I guess it's legal now. And since she asked for it, maybe I can ask for it too. Maybe if she's not a strain on others, then I won't be a strain on others. And so someone might even claim it's what they want, but they were impacted by the choice of another, by the influence of, of another, by the example of another. Well, such a person would be evaluated by a doctor and or psychiatrist 
who would find no actual evidence of extreme distress, and the person would be told that this is not an appropriate course of action, because, as you said, they don't really want to die. The way you ask this question provides its own answer. Congratulations! You get the Caller of the Day award for being honest and answering your own question. Let me give you my own hypothetical case in which I think it is incredibly obvious that assisted suicide is the preferable option, just to really help flesh out the bare principle of what we're talking about, because clearly it needs to be done. Let's imagine what I'm calling the ripped apart by a bear thought experiment. No prizes for guessing what it's about. Imagine that you and a friend are out hiking in the woods. Suddenly, a bear runs out of the woods and attacks your friend, mutilating him in an absolutely horrific way before strolling off. As you turn to look, you see that your friend has been physically ripped in half. His entire lower body is gone, ripped off above the waist. His chest is slashed to the bone, and a couple of his ribs are loose on the ground next to him. One of his arms is torn off at the shoulder. The other is shredded but still somewhat functional, enough to flail around and reach out hopelessly toward the sky. His face has also been slashed, and he's screaming through what's left of his mouth. In between his screams, he manages to gurgle frantic, repeated requests that you kill me. Kill me, please, make it stop. Now, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that in this instance, you know two things. Number one, there is no chance that any sort of medical assistance will arrive in time, so there is no chance that your friend is going to make it out alive. Number two, left alone, you know that your friend will die after about 10 minutes of this unimaginable physical and psychological pain. However, conveniently, you happen to have a tank of argon connected to a surgical mask. You could give this mask to your friend, causing him to slip into unconsciousness in about a minute without feeling like he's suffocating, just getting tired and drifting off. So, the question is, in a situation like this, would you still oppose assisted suicide? Would you honestly stand there, watching your friend bleed out on the ground for the full ten minutes as he screams in pain, or would you give him the mask as he requested? Or, to put a slightly different spin on this thought experiment, let's imagine that you and your friend knew ahead of time, with near certainty, that twenty minutes from now, your friend was going to be ripped apart by a bear in this fashion. And so, instead of waiting to be physically ripped apart by a bear, he decides to take a cyanide pill and die that way instead. Would you slap the pill out of his hand and demand that he has to die by being physically ripped apart by a bear? Or would you say your goodbyes and let him take the pill? Now, you might object that this is a ridiculous, over-the-top thought experiment, but if we can't even agree on the basic principle of assisted suicide, even in the most favorable situation, then we need to discuss the basic principle of assisted suicide, not the incidental legal issues and potential gray areas. Part 3. Can Two Wrongs Make a Right? Stephanie's book starts with one of her most basic objections to assisted suicide, which is that suicide is not made okay simply by being assisted. As she puts it, If suicide is wrong, and if homicide is wrong, then uniting the two in a situation where you have a type of suicide-homicide does not make them right. Instead, the combination is just as wrong. This argument is cartoonishly oversimplistic. By this reasoning, you could also argue that because speeding is illegal, and because kidnapping is illegal, therefore, ambulances should be illegal. After all, you can't just unite the two, where you have a kind of speeding kidnapping and say that it's okay to dash an unconscious person through traffic in the back of your truck, can you? How can two illegal things together be considered legal? Well, it depends on the circumstances. Clearly, it's not always wrong to speed, although it certainly does sound strange to say it this way without providing context. In a very similar way, I would argue that neither suicide nor homicide are always wrong, and uniting the two is not always wrong either. If you had the chance to go back in time to 1943 and murder Adolf Hitler, that would seem to be the right thing to do. A similar argument could be made about murdering in self-defense as well.
and if you were about to die by being physically ripped apart by a bear, but you had a cyanide pill handy and enough time to take it, I honestly don't see anything wrong with choosing the cyanide pill in that circumstance. The idea that assisted suicide is wrong because two wrongs don't make a right is a tone-deaf catchphrase, one which presumes that suicide and homicide are, in fact, always wrong. I think it's very clear that, in some very particular cases, speeding and or kidnapping should be legal, and in other very particular cases, suicide and or homicide can be the right thing to do. The argument that two wrongs don't make a right is not an argument against assisted suicide. It's an admission of your own ignorance of the subject. Part 4. Why are some suicides okay, but not others? This is a topic which Stephanie and Sean discuss at length in their interview. Why do proponents of assisted suicide try to prevent some suicides while fervently supporting others? It's a good question, and I think it deserves a detailed answer. So one of the points you make in the book I thought was fascinating is that society generally decries suicide, but makes exceptions when we put assisted in front of it. So I want to clarify, tell me if I'm getting this right, is that people typically resist suicide. If the person wants it, if they're emotionally suffering, we should stop it. When it comes to assisted suicide, we qualify it for different reasons. You're saying there's no qualitative difference between the two. And any criteria we give to say you shouldn't commit suicide is going to bring some kind of contradiction and inconsistency when we talk about assisted suicide. So I guess I'm bringing together in my mind, we tend to think about these as like different issues. And you're saying actually they're exactly the same issues. The particulars change, but the principles are the same for both of them. So... Why do I try to stop someone from jumping off a bridge, but then turn around and support their right to take a lethal injection under supervision? In both situations, the person wants to die, and it's their life, presumably to do with as they please, so why the double standard? Why is it only when you dress up the word suicide with the word assisted that it suddenly becomes such a good idea? Well, let's consider a similar situation. If a friend of ours tried to burn their house down in a fit of rage, most of us would probably try to stop them from doing it. But, if our friend wanted to demolish their house in order to rebuild it, or even just to repurpose the land, we probably wouldn't try to stop them. Why is this? By Stephanie's reasoning, there is no qualitative difference between these two situations, because the person wants to do it, and it's their property. So why do we try to stop them in the former situation, but not the latter? Isn't this contradictory and inconsistent? Of course, the reason we try to stop our friend in the former situation, but not the latter, is because we are looking out for their long-term happiness. It's pretty clear that our friend's anger is more fleeting than a destroyed house, and that our friend can be made to feel better in the long run if their house isn't burned down. Whereas, if they have a plan to remodel their house or repurpose the land, even if it means downgrading their living conditions, well, good for them if that's what they want long term. The key factor is their prognosis. This is why I support assisted suicide in some cases, but not others. It depends on the person's long term situation, and if their problems truly cannot be overcome and lead to them being happier in the long run. This is a key part of the assistance being proposed. Doctors and psychiatrists should be involved to help determine a person's long-term situation, not simply to administer the lethal procedure whenever a person decides they want to die. When we come across someone standing on a bridge threatening to jump, we know that, most of the time, this is a person whose problems can be solved and who can get better and live a happier life in the long run, so in these cases, it is rational to try and prevent their death. Compare this to someone who we know will not get better, like someone dying from cancer or someone whose depression hasn't responded to any known treatments. These people are not going to get better, and they will be tortured by their own bodies until they die. In cases like these, they are not grateful that someone stopped them from jumping, so to speak, and their long-term happiness is, 
unfortunately, very, very unlikely to be achievable. That is the difference. This is why we prevent our friend from torching their house in a fit of rage, but not from demolishing it in a controlled and well-considered manner as they look to the future. Assisted property damage, you might call it. The fact that Stephanie seems completely unaware of why these two situations are different tells me that she did very little research and very few interviews in writing her book. This is a relatively standard answer to the question of why we support one person's suicide, but not another, an answer which most considered supporters of assisted suicide can articulate if you're willing to listen. Part 5. Start with what? Stephanie's ignorance of why people support assisted suicide is underpinned by the naive premise of her book. Stephanie seems to think that every person with a horrible condition can always find enough emotional counterbalance to offset their pain and suffering and their torturous natural deaths. She seems to think that there is always a sufficient coping mechanism available, and in search of such a mechanism, she suggests that people start with what? What can I do now? What good can I draw from my situation? Now, to be clear, I do think that this can be helpful for a lot of people. In the book, Stephanie cites many examples of people with horrible and painful conditions who still manage to find enough happiness in life to outweigh that pain. And you know what? That's awesome. If Stephanie's argument was simply that things are not as hopeless as they seem, and if her concern was simply that people reach for suicide too quickly, I would absolutely appreciate the point she's trying to make. But that is not the point she's trying to make. Her argument is not simply that these kinds of coping mechanisms are stronger than most people think. Her argument is that these kinds of coping mechanisms are always strong enough for literally everyone, and that there is not one situation which a person cannot emotionally lift themselves out of. That is total, naive bullshit. Tell this to the person with FOP whose ribcage is starting to become too rigid for them to breathe. Tell this to someone whose depression has resisted every possible treatment and lifestyle change. Tell this to your friend as they're lying on the ground, ripped apart by a bear. Just as Stephanie cites examples of people overcoming horrible conditions, I can just as easily cite examples of people who were never able to find happiness despite their best efforts. There are some people who simply cannot cope with their situations, especially if they've already started down the process of dying a horrific death. You could certainly argue that this set of people could be made smaller, but to argue that this set of people could be reduced to zero is simply, and unfortunately, naive and absurd. Stephanie, if my friend is lying on the ground, ripped in half by a bear, screaming out what's left of his lungs, your advice would seem to be that I should kneel down beside him and ask him, What can you do in response to this? What amazing, wonderful, incredible thing can you bring out of this terrible, horrible, horrific thing? What? Stop screaming. Listen. What can... Dude, come on. He doesn't want to listen. It's like he doesn't even want to learn a life lesson right now. Does this seem like a good approach to situations like these? No, it doesn't because it is naive and monstrously unempathetic. I honestly don't think that people like Stephanie truly understand just how much it is possible to suffer. My fiancé left me is just the tip of the iceberg. Part 6. Life is a gift. Another argument Stephanie makes is that life is a gift from God, and that it should be preserved on that basis. This, of course, presupposes that there is a God in the first place, but putting that aside, it also raises the question, if life is a gift, then why can't we decide to give it back, or otherwise to rid ourselves of it? You know, like we expect to be free to do with any other gift we receive. Stephanie does try to answer this question, but it is perhaps the weakest rebuttal in her entire book. The gift of life is so valuable... It's priceless. We're not talking about getting an article of clothing that will go out of style. Instead, imagine being given a billion dollars. It wouldn't make sense to use only a portion of it and say, I don't want it anymore, 
and then proceed to burn the rest. So, too, would it be wrong to live a portion of our lives and then prematurely destroy them. What do you mean, it wouldn't make sense? Why not? Sure, maybe it wouldn't make sense to you if you were in that situation in light of your desires regarding money, but another person may place different value on this thing they now own. Do you think it should be illegal to destroy a monetary gift given to you? Do you think it should be illegal to reject a gift if the giver values it highly enough? Is this really the kind of thing you want to impose by force of law? Stephanie attempts to amend this thought experiment by essentially arguing that, well, it would be rude to destroy a gift in this way. After all, if someone gives you a gift and you destroy it right in front of them, isn't that kind of horrible? Shouldn't we try to discourage this kind of behavior? As Stephanie puts it, Can you imagine throwing a present in the face of a parent who lovingly gave his child a toy that will bring happiness? Well, yes, if that toy doesn't actually bring happiness, but instead brings horrible suffering, then yes, absolutely throw it back in the parent's face. What kind of parent does that to their child? What kind of parent gives their child a gift which causes horrible suffering, and then forces them to keep it until it finally kills them in agonizing pain. That is not love. It's not even tough love. That is abuse. Introducing the Megacore Protopet. Your child will shriek with joy when he meets our adorable friend. Wanna play ball? So does the Protopet. Need a partner for tag? Go find the Protopet. Up for some cops and robbers? Help! So is you know who. Just ask Billy. No! The Megacore Protopet. Maybe instead of asking, why would anyone invent such a horrible monster, we should instead ask, what can I do now that I've been given the Protopet as a gift? Well, can I give it back? No, you can't. That would not make sense. You have to keep it because it's a gift. Stephanie's assertion that it doesn't make sense to return a gift, such as the gift of life, is absurd at every turn. If life truly is a gift to us, then we should be allowed to reject it. And if we can't reject it, and if it causes horrendous suffering, then it's not a gift, it's a curse. The argument that life must be preserved because it's a gift is nothing more than an ill-considered false analogy. Part 7 we don't know the future. Another argument Stephanie offers is that we don't know the future with certainty. We like to be in control of our lives, but we don't always know what's best for us. What if the person who is suffering could eventually find a solution? What if, in their final moments, they realize something about themselves that makes them grateful for the time they were given to realize it? Unfortunately for Stephanie, the example of this she provides in her book only serves to prove how naive and unrealistic this argument is. On page 86, she tells the story of an 11-year-old boy with a rare form of muscular dystrophy, lying in a hospital bed, bleeding all over his body. The doctors warned that if he returned home from the hospital, he would suffer an agonizing death. Stephanie does correctly identify this situation as a prime example of when assisted suicide would seem to make sense. This is very similar to the ripped apart by a bear example we discussed earlier. So, how did this boy's situation resolve itself in a way which shows that suicide was not a reasonable option? What is Stephanie's solution to a situation like this? Her solution is, and I shit you not, this is actually how the problem was solved, a miracle happened. The boy's bleeding stopped, and he lived for another two years. Right, so let's just stop doing everything that carries risk, because, who knows, we might not make the best choice, and a miracle might happen. Let's stop all work as linemen and loggers, because God might make food appear in our fridge. Let's stop performing surgeries, because, who knows, God might miraculously fix our damaged intestines. The argument that we don't know the future, so the risk of unnecessarily committing suicide is always too great, is just plain ridiculous. By and large, we do have the power to make reasonable inferences about the future, and it is sufficiently rational to act on these inferences in an attempt to maximize well-being 
or simply to minimize suffering if that's all we can do in some cases. For every example Stephanie gives where doctors' dire predictions were thankfully wrong, there are many more examples where their predictions were completely right, and the patient suffered and died like something out of a Saw movie. Stephanie's cartoonish levels of medical agnosticism are not the result of actual medical evidence, but of naive wishful thinking. Many people do not get better. Many people are simply tortured by their own bodies until they die. That is their future, which, in some very particular and unfortunate cases, we can know with very reasonable certainty. In those cases, it seems entirely reasonable to allow people the choice to not endure that kind of living nightmare. Part 8. The People You Leave Behind Another argument Stephanie offers is that assisted suicide harms the people you leave behind. If I was talking to someone from a secular perspective, I would make also the point that when we make decisions that seem to only affect us, the question we want to ask is, do those decisions only affect us? Or does any choice we make actually have a profound ripple effect on other people's lives? So the reality is when someone ends their life, whether by themselves or with the assistance of another, it does not just impact them. It impacts the people around them who are left behind, for example, to put the pieces together. And so he tells a story in his book of a young man who ultimately jumped and how he eventually connected with that young man's parents. And one of his observations was that man's death didn't just affect him. It affected his whole family that was left behind to, to work through and live with the, the impact in the wake of the choice that he'd made. So the idea that if I end my life, it doesn't impact you uh, is proven false. Strictly speaking, there is almost nothing we do which only impacts ourselves. Even something as innocuous as what color shirt we wear does technically impact other people. So the question is not whether our actions affect other people. It is, to what extent do our actions affect other people, compared to the extent that they affect us? In the case of assisted suicide, unless killing yourself causes your family members to wish that they were dead as well, then you have the bigger stake in the situation, and your well-being dominates the equation. It is trivially true that this personal decision doesn't affect only you, but unless your death is more painful to other people than your continued life is painful to you, then I don't see how anyone can force you to stay alive because of the people you leave behind. This is especially true in cases where a person is going to die soon anyway, in which case their family is already going to feel bad about losing the person, so suicide wouldn't really change the equation all that much. In fact, assisted suicide can help to reduce the collateral emotional damage by making the process deliberate and planned, alleviating the uncertainty about which day will be the last day. Also worth mentioning is the fact that people are going to kill themselves whether or not assisted suicide is legal, and allowing the person's suicide to be deliberate and planned greatly reduces the collateral emotional damage compared to suicides performed alone and in secret which are often discovered later by a family member. If you are really so concerned about collateral emotional damage, think about finding your father's corpse hanging by the neck in your garage one morning, and tell me how that's less distressing than if he had explained his reasons for wanting to die, set a date, and then died in a controlled manner after saying goodbye. Which of these suicides is better for the people he left behind? And, of course, the collateral emotional damage is even less severe in situations where the person's friends and family agree with their decision to die and support their choice. In these situations, the argument that assisted suicide is bad for the people you leave behind wouldn't seem to apply at all. So what does Stephanie have to say about situations like these? What if the people you leave behind are okay with your suicide? So what if the family comes together and says, hey, we agree this is best, you're suffering, we're all in agreement here that it's the most compassionate thing to do is for you to end your life. Does that change the equation? Because it seems that dynamic and obligation there, at least a family, uh, would change. 
I would say that even when people seem united on a position, if the position is inherently wrong, then it's not ethical. Ah, right. So it never really was about the people you leave behind, was it, Stephanie? If you're just going to fall back on suicide being inherently wrong, then why bother mentioning the window dressing of collateral emotional damage? If suicide is inherently wrong, then the situational circumstances of the people you leave behind don't actually inform your conclusion, do they? But let's look at what she said. She said that suicide is inherently wrong. So, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the motivation or the context, killing yourself is just wrong inherently, in and of itself, because of what it is. That is a very bold claim, one which I cannot imagine Stephanie is prepared to defend. What if killing yourself was the only way to save your three children? What if killing yourself was the only way to save all of humanity? Would it still be inherently wrong? Would Stephanie still oppose it? And I have to wonder, would Stephanie say the same thing about killing in general? Is killing inherently wrong? What if it's in self-defense? Or what about lying? Is lying inherently wrong, even if you're protecting Jews from Nazis? This is the problem with declaring certain actions to be inherently wrong. You're probably just going to end up creating unnecessary philosophical dead ends that you don't even believe yourself. Now, to be fair, I don't think Stephanie actually understands the definition of inherently in the first place, because in her book, she actually says that the violin is an inherently sad instrument. Violin, inherently, sad. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. So as we can see, the people you leave behind is not really a good argument against assisted suicide, especially since it doesn't actually seem to inform Stephanie's conclusion. If suicide is inherently wrong, then the argument about the people you leave behind is little more than a red herring. Part 9. The Slippery Slope Another argument against assisted suicide is that there is no specific standard for how much pain a person has to be in for assisted suicide to be warranted. What degree of suffering is enough for us to support that? Because all of our relatives suffer. People will always suffer. So how do we decide the degree of suffering that justifies the, the, the ending of someone's life? I can imagine the pushback would be, well, that's just a slippery slope fallacy. Why can't we just say, if you have six months left to live and it's terminal, then we'll just draw the line right there because we got to draw it somewhere. Sure, for several reasons. First, it is entirely arbitrary. And although the person suggesting six months might be satisfied with that, there are many people who would be dissatisfied and say, that's unfair. I have a year and I don't want to live for another year. Yes, Stephanie, the exact location of the line is technically arbitrary, and there will always be people who aren't happy with it. This will always be true. This is true for the length of prison sentences. This is true for the age at which a person becomes a legal adult. And this is true for how many seconds it takes to fully cook a pot roast. All of these answers are somewhat arbitrary, and they are not perfect for everyone. If you are not comfortable drawing a line in the sand somewhere because, whoa, it's technically arbitrary, guys, and some people won't like it, then I'm sorry, but you have no place telling society what to do. The real world has shades of gray. The real world has trade-offs. Deal with it. To the more specific question of who gets to decide where to draw the line, as I've previously explained, this would be something that we largely hand over to doctors and psychiatrists, who are trained to understand a person's situation and provide a prognosis. And if you're so concerned with people being unhappy about where we draw the line, then I would suggest that drawing the line at absolutely zero is probably the worst option. Part 10. Improving Treatments Another argument Stephanie presents is that assisted suicide undermines our motivation to create better treatments for certain conditions and diseases. If we already have a solution, in the form of suicide, 
then why would we bother trying to find better solutions? If I eliminate the person whose pain I can't yet correct, what motivation do I or society have to try to come up with better pain meds or to try to come up with cures? I think, for example, of before we had uh, insulin for diabetics, diabetics would die very early. Um, if we just killed someone with diabetes because we didn't have insulin, what motivation would we have had to come up with insulin? It was only because there was this unsolved problem that we were seeking a solution. But when we kill someone, we've kind of come up with the solution. So therefore, we don't feel the same degree of crisis to come up with a real solution or a, a better solution. This is one of those arguments where we need to ask ourselves, is this actually how the world works, or is this just a thought experiment that kind of feels correct? Unfortunately for Stephanie's argument, when we look at the real world, it's pretty clear to see that simply having a solution to a medical problem doesn't mean that we stop searching for better solutions. This is because merely having a solution doesn't mean that it's a good solution. Notice how we no longer take children to chickenpox parties because we have the varicella vaccine. Notice how people don't get their tonsils removed much anymore because we've developed better alternatives. Notice how we no longer quarantine people with smallpox because, well, we've completely eradicated it. Did the previous solutions to these medical problems destroy our motivation to find better solutions? No, they didn't. As just one more example, which is ongoing, we've made tremendous progress in controlling the effects of HIV and AIDS through novel antiviral therapies. And yet, we're still working hard to create a vaccine. Does Stephanie oppose these novel treatments on the grounds that they've theoretically robbed us of our motivation to find a vaccine? Should we force people with AIDS to suffer the most torturous symptoms in order to keep our vaccine motivation up? I sincerely hope Stephanie doesn't think so, but at this point, I wouldn't put anything past her. Assisted suicide may be the best option for ending a person's pain at this time, but no one thinks that this is an ideal solution. No one is happy about the fact that death is the best option in some cases. It is obvious to everyone that if we could find a cure for FOP, maybe some kind of gene therapy for example, that would be a better solution than waiting until a person with FOP is so far gone that they literally want to die. Merely having a solution does not remove our motivation to try and find better solutions. This is why we continue to develop better and better treatments, and this is why medical science has continued to advance even in fields where treatments already exist. The idea that assisted suicide removes our motivation to create alternatives is not only ridiculous on its face, it is demonstrably false. Part 11. Dignity. Stephanie and Sean spend a lot of time talking about dignity, and I think this is perhaps one of the biggest red herrings of the interview and of Stephanie's book. In some ways, at the heart of this debate is the question of, of dignity. Is it something you have because of what you do or something inherent? I think people like Sean and Stephanie try to focus the conversation around the word dignity because they think they can objectively define this word in such a way that it refers to a person simply being alive, which would therefore mean that assisted suicide does not confer or preserve dignity. However, I think this demonstrates that they have not actually engaged with people who disagree with them. When I use the word dignity in this context, I'm not appealing to some objective, absolute definition of the word itself. I'm just using it as a simple way to refer to the wide collection of disturbing emotions a person experiences when they are in a situation that is so bad that suicide becomes a desirable option. To put it simply, many people in those situations feel like they've, well, lost their dignity. This is not a metaphysical claim, it's an expression of emotional pain, which exists on top of whatever physical pain that person is already experiencing. Dignity is just a useful shorthand. But let's see what Sean and Stephanie have to say about dignity. This woman had been very wealthy, and there was this one piece of artwork by a famous artist that when the people went into the apartment 
found it, they realized it was worth, I think it was over a million euros wow. and it was ultimately auctioned off. But the painting upon discovery didn't look very good because it was covered in dust and it was covered in cobwebs. And so I often use that in order to ask people the question, did the painting lose its worth? Did it lose its value? A, because no one knew about it and B, because it was covered in dust. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you should ask the painting. Oh, right. You can't, because this analogy is ridiculously off-base. Not only is a painting incapable of experiencing suffering, and thus it is unable to express the feeling that it has lost its dignity, but a painting is only worth whatever someone else is willing to pay for it. It has no inherent value, which is affected by how much dust it has. This might honestly be the worst analogy I've ever heard for anything. This analogy also exemplifies Stephanie's naive foundational premise, which is the idea that anyone can just be brushed off and made better again, or just made better in a different way than they were before, no matter how horrible their suffering might be. Stephanie and Sean routinely ignore the primary cases where assisted suicide is most relevant, people who cannot be made better, and people who are only going to get worse. Dusting off a painting does not even begin to describe the suffering these people are being forced to endure, or the terrible prognoses they are faced with. Um, as I mentioned, you know, maybe you're soiling yourself, maybe you're vomiting, all kinds of things, but it's not that we lose our dignity in those moments. It's that those things might seem to be like the dust on the painting. They seem to cover up a bit our dignity. And so the way we show that we actually have dignity is not to throw our lives out, but to change the person who can't change themselves, to wipe the drool off the person who cannot wipe themselves, you know, to, to give comfort and surround the individual with beauty. And when we respond that way, we're showing, oh, you have dignity because of who you are. This is the section of the interview that truly disgusted me. Stephanie is actually sitting there, trying to justify a nearly complete lack of basic human empathy, claiming that she knows what any of this is like because my fiancé left me at the altar. She proposes a hypothetical person, disfigured, mutilated, and suffering, not only physically, but also psychologically, a person who may even be disturbed by their own reflection, a prisoner in their own abusive jailer of a body. And yet, Stephanie Connors sits there, comfortable in her little studio, saying that the only real obligation we have to this hypothetical person is to wipe the drool from their mouth and surround them with beauty, because that's giving them their dignity back. That's all that really matters, and it's fine to force them to stay this way against their will so long as we surround them with beauty and wipe the drool from their mouths. What the fuck is wrong with you, Stephanie? If it were me in that situation, I would find the strength to spit on you. It's interesting because if I think of, you know, different campaigns to, you know, amongst teenagers, help them with their self-esteem, help young girls, you know, you know, see their value. It's, it's all oriented to a message that aligns with what you just said, where we tell young girls, your value isn't in how popular you are. It isn't in your looks. It isn't in how much makeup is caked on your face. Your value is in who you are. But we seem to lose that message when it comes to the end of life. We don't teach teenage girls that their value is inherent to them as biological humans, and that simply having a pulse is what gives them their dignity or their value. We teach teenagers and children that they have the power to assign their own value and their own dignity, whatever that means to them. I mean, hell, this was the entire point of Zuko's character arc in Avatar The Last Airbender. You know, the kids' show. I thought I had lost my honor and that somehow my father could return it to me. But I know now that no one can give you your honor. It's something you earn for yourself by choosing to do what's right. Stephanie is the one who is losing sight of this message. As we'll see later in this video, all that really matters to Stephanie, the only criterion for a person to have dignity or value as far as she is concerned, is that the person is technically alive as a human organism, no matter how horrible that existence is, and will continue to be. So that's why I think it is so important that we be proclaimers of a message of an inherent dignity. And that means proclaiming the gospel. And that's one of the things I wrestled with and I talk about in my preface. 
do I write a book that is totally non-sectarian where I just make, you know, arguments against uh, assisted suicide almost from a human rights perspective, human equality perspective, or do I incorporate the gospel message? And I think you can go so far with a non-religious message, but I really believe the fullness of the message against assisted suicide really involves a gospel-centered message. And once again, as the secular arguments run out of gas, Stephanie has no choice but to assert her own personal religious view. All she can really say is, well, my version of Christianity says that it's wrong. Good for you, Stephanie. Come back when you have something for the rest of us, because your secular arguments so far have been really unconvincing. If there is a God who loved me so much that he willed me into existence, and then when I separated myself from him, he, like a lover, came running back to me and gave his life so that I would have a chance at eternal life uh, because that's how valuable I am, because I bear his image because he loves me, then, then that's the message, if all that's true, that we need to proclaim and help people understand so then they realize their dignity can't be lost. So if there is a God who loved you so much that he willed you into existence, that same God wants to make sure that if you end up mutilated and screaming in pain, he gets to wring out every last drop of suffering from you before you eventually die. Because he loves you, and because it fulfills his definition of the word dignity. Is this a joke, Stephanie? Are we supposed to take this seriously? The final thing I want to say on the topic of dignity is to address the specific topic of so-called death with dignity laws. I realize that assisted suicide laws are often called death with dignity laws, but I want to be clear that it's not about dignity per se. It's about the suffering and pain a person is experiencing and their desire to end it, however they choose to describe it. Dignity, control, making peace with yourself, whatever. As a point of comparison, consider another type of law that already exists. In some states here in the US, we have laws which allow people under age 21 to drink alcohol under the supervision of a legal guardian. We call these drink with your dad laws, but these laws are not about fathers. No one is doing a deep dive into the role of fathers as they relate to consuming alcohol. It's just a catchy name. Calling them drink with your dad laws does not mean that mothers are inferior parents with regard to alcohol, just as calling them death with dignity laws does not mean that people in these situations can't have dignity otherwise. It's just a catchy name. So that's all I have to say about dignity. As I said before, the way that Stephanie and Sean talk about dignity really gives me the impression that they have not seriously engaged with people who disagree with them. Part 12. Man's Best Friend A common question for people who oppose assisted suicide, and one that I myself have asked, is if we consider it humane to put down dogs when they are suffering horribly, then why is it not likewise humane to allow people who are also suffering horribly to end their lives if they so choose? Why do we treat dogs better than we treat people? There are several responses to this question, but Stephanie's response is, in my opinion, the most sociopathic response I have ever heard. She begins her answer by drawing an analogy to slavery in order to try and pin down how we approach these issues more broadly. And credit where credit is due, this is actually a reasonably intelligent line of inquiry. So let's answer her question about slavery. I would ask someone who makes that claim to think for a moment about a question that seems off topic, and that is, why is slavery wrong? What is it about slavery that we who believe in human rights object to? Well, I object to slavery because of the obvious and insurmountable suffering that it causes. Humans just cannot be made to happily accept these kinds of conditions. However, if humans had a fundamentally different psychology, which made us love being slaves to each other, then I'd have no real objection to slavery. I don't think I would be able to tell these hypothetical people why they should stop, nor would I see any reason to try. As another hypothetical to reinforce this point, 
if human psychology was fundamentally cooperative, as the 20th century communists desperately wanted to believe, then communism would work, and I'd have no real objection to communism either. The reason I oppose slavery and communism is because we know that these things cause immense and unnecessary human suffering. The human mind simply cannot accommodate these conditions happily. That's my answer, but what is Stephanie's answer to why slavery is wrong? And of course, what it is is that it involves treating humans as objects rather than subjects. We view our peers based on their usefulness to us, what they can do or not do, and what we can get from them. And we also view that individual as disposable so that when they're no longer producing what we want, like an object would, we can get rid of them or we can trade them in for something better. And we reject that perspective. Instead, we say, wait a minute, humans are subjects, not objects. We should be valued for who we are, not what we do, not how we make others feel. So that identification of what makes us different from objects tells us that we therefore need to treat each other differently than how we treat objects. So we cannot view the human person as disposable nor can we view their value based on their function. And yet, as we'll see in the next part of this video, it is you, Stephanie, who ignores people as subjects when their subjective desires include wanting to die in a less painful way or in a shorter time frame than what they would otherwise endure. When people express their desire to die, you very conspicuously begin talking about them as if they were just objects to be kept alive, regardless of their desires as subjects. This will be the topic of the next part, so for now, let's get back to the topic of dogs, and why it's good to put down a suffering dog, but not a suffering human. So that identification of what makes us different from objects tells us that we therefore need to treat each other differently than how we treat objects. So we cannot view the human person as disposable, nor can we view their value based on their function. So when a dog can no longer, you know, walk or do other things, well, you can't do what you once did, so we'll get rid of you. Okay, let's just take a step back and think about what Stephanie just said. Stephanie said that she will put down a dog if it no longer functions properly as a canine object. If it no longer amuses her, if it can no longer play fetch with her, then its usefulness to her is just not worth the maintenance. That's how Stephanie views dogs. I just think it's important to point out that this is the kind of person Stephanie is, and that this is how she answers the question of why it's good to euthanize dogs, but never people. Just to be clear, a normal, well-adjusted person euthanizes their dog because it is suffering and because it will not get better not because it's a canine object which no longer does what it says on the box. So not only does Stephanie's question about slavery not actually indicate the answer she was aiming for, at least not for me, but her answer to the question is basically that humans are the only things with value, and it's perfectly okay to kill your dog simply because it no longer amuses you. Brilliant answer, Stephanie. Let's move on. Part 13. Love and Objectification As I mentioned in the previous two parts, I contend that it is Stephanie who is objectifying people as she makes her arguments, valuing people not for who they are, but for what they are, and ignoring their desires when she disagrees with them. This is a bold accusation for me to make, but it becomes clear that this is what she is doing when she talks about the concept of love. But the value of a human isn't in our function or accomplishment, it's in our nature. What is our nature? Well, as image bearers, our nature is that of God. And God is a communion of persons who's always in a relationship of love, of giving and receiving love. No matter what suffering we face, no matter what circumstance we're in, we're always capable of love, whether we're giving love or whether we're receiving love. But we cannot fulfill that nature of love 
without life. So according to Stephanie, being physically alive is the only way we can receive love, and this is where our value comes from. As long as this bag of cells is technically alive, then it's at least capable of receiving love, and that's all that matters, no matter how much pain this bag of cells claims to be experiencing. It just has to lie there, being alive, so it can receive love, regardless of its wishes. Yeah, Stephanie, you really seem to care about not objectifying people. You'll also notice that we've come back to, because my god said so, but let's continue. If we are not alive, we cannot love. And so when we treat the human like the family pet, and we end that human's life the way we end the life of the family pet, we're eliminating the very life that is necessary to be in a relationship of love. So if love requires life, then what happens to people after they die, according to Christianity? Are the dead people in heaven incapable of being loved? Are they incapable of loving God? Is God incapable of loving them? If you believe that your dead friends are in heaven, then does this mean that they are no longer capable of receiving love? Surely that's not the case, right? Surely, if the mind and soul survive the death of the body, then love doesn't suddenly become impossible after death. I honestly don't think that Stephanie understands the theological can of worms she's just opened, but it seems clear that, within Christianity, love does not require life, so this entire argument makes no sense. We ought to preserve the body and keep the body as healthy as possible. Yep, regardless of what the person says they want as a subject, just keep this ugly bag of mostly water alive. Ugly, giant, bag of mostly water. Totally not objectifying them. Part 14. Religious Arguments I've been harping on Stephanie for falling back on religious arguments when her secular ones fail. But there is one religious argument which, while I would still disagree with its premise, I could at least respect as a valid argument whose conclusion actually follows. This argument is the possibility of hell. If people who commit suicide go to hell, and if hell is an infinitely painful experience full of the worst possible suffering, then it would make sense for Christians like Stephanie to oppose assisted suicide, because assisted suicide would only lead to even worse suffering in hell. That would make sense. Unfortunately, nowhere in Stephanie's book, nor in her conversation with Sean McDowell, does she even mention hell, and I'm surprised that Sean McDowell, who has spoken about hell before, and who does believe in hell, didn't bring it up. So if hell is not a concern, and if the only supernatural consequence of suicide is that it makes God sad, and it makes you feel bad that other people aren't obeying him, then you know what? Fine. Let God be sad, let yourself be sad, and let people in horrible pain put an end to the torture. Your sadness that someone is not properly honoring their creator is not worse than the horrible, torturous pain of someone living with FOP or untreatable depression. The way I see it, the real problem with Stephanie's reliance on religious arguments, rather than our shared sense of empathy and our value of pleasure and aversion to pain, is that she could just as easily be sitting there arguing that the Holocaust was not actually wrong. No, really, the Holocaust was fine. I mean, yeah, it did create horrific suffering the likes of which humanity has rarely seen, but suffering and death don't really matter. What really matters is the will and the sovereignty of God. The Bible makes it clear that God has every right to punish the Jews, even by sending other nations against them, like he may well have done with Germany during the 1940s. The horrible suffering this created is certainly sad, but if you actually think that the Holocaust was a bad thing, then you're just not thinking biblically. Now, just to be clear, I'm not accusing Stephanie of making this exact argument. I don't know what she thinks about the Holocaust. My point is simply that this is the kind of argument she is making about assisted suicide. Suffering doesn't really matter so long as God's will is being done, because that's what really matters for, uh, you know, reasons. It's totally fine if millions of people suffer in unimaginable agony, 
just so long as they don't make God sad. Give me a break. One final point about religious arguments is that, while Stephanie doesn't mention hell, she does briefly mention heaven. On page 21 of her book, after citing a passage from the book of Revelation, she says, So a new, suffering-free life awaits us, but until that next part comes, we should carefully reverence the gift of life God has given us until it comes to its end. I've already addressed the idea that life is a gift, even if we assume the truth of Christianity, so with that out of the way, it's pretty clear to see that Stephanie's belief in heaven only serves to weaken her argument against assisted suicide. If heaven is the next stage of our existence, and if hell isn't a factor, then let God be sad, let yourself be sad, and let people whose lives are living nightmares make the transition to a new, suffering-free existence. It's not rocket science. Part 15. Suffering and Empathy I had to watch my mother die from cancer. The doctors tried everything, but she only got worse. The cancer was all over her body, and she had an IV drip of painkillers at home, but even that wasn't enough to stop her from grimacing as she struggled to breathe because of the fluid that was filling her lungs. On top of that, she had undergone a slew of mastectomy surgeries that would disturb anyone who had to endure them. I was only nine years old at the time, and my only thought was the fear that I was going to lose my mom. But it's clear to me now how selfish and immature that was. If I had been the person I am today, and if my mother had told me that the physical and psychological torture of having her body repeatedly mutilated was not worth living for, I would have loved her enough to help her die before it got worse. Which it did. Had I been an adult at the time, the thought of forcing her to stay like that until she physically gave out, drowning in her own fluid-filled lungs, there is not a word to describe how depraved and inhuman that would be. Anyone who would force another person to live like that against their will with no hope of recovery and with no overriding concern like the fear of the person going to hell is a monster. As far as I'm concerned, Stephanie Connors is a monster. Now, to be clear, assisted suicide is a difficult topic, and I don't begrudge anyone for struggling with it if they haven't really thought about it. But for someone like Stephanie to come down so hard against it, writing an entire book on the subject, without even having addressed the fundamental reasons why people like me support assisted suicide, that crosses a line into deliberate and malicious ignorance. The fact that Stephanie Connors can sit there, declaring that she knows what it's like because my fiancé left me, is disturbing. The fact that she thinks she can unilaterally declare that everyone's life is worth living is beyond arrogant. The idea that a person needs to stay alive for as long as possible while their own bodies torture them to death is simply unforgivable. Stephanie Gray Connors is a monster who doesn't even have enough sense to recognize her own fundamental lack of basic human empathy. Part 16. Conclusions while I can certainly appreciate some of the ideas that these arguments have brought to light, such as who qualifies for assisted suicide, and why we think some suicides are okay but not others, I think I've demonstrated that none of these arguments are sound reasons for opposing assisted suicide. The only other reasons to oppose assisted suicide are religious reasons, which, as an atheist, I of course reject and I view these as yet another way that religion tries to ruin the game for everyone else. Trust me, there really is this invisible, secret layer of reality that has different rules from the physical reality that we all share. So just keep sleeping on the floor, keep chopping your dicks off, and keep refusing common-sense medical interventions aimed at reducing suffering. Because one day, it'll all make sense. Not today, and not here, but trust me. Now, of course, if a particular religion was true, then I would have to concede that these rules make sense after all. However, in the case of Stephanie Connors, even if her religion was true, her opposition to assisted suicide still wouldn't make sense. She doesn't seem to think that suicide will land a person in hell, 
and her ideas about how we should interact with gifts are completely off base, and her ideas about how a person can receive love seem to flatly contradict the idea of there being love in heaven. There is simply nothing about Stephanie Connor's arguments, religious or secular, which supports her conclusion that assisted suicide should be illegal. At best, her arguments rely on unjustified optimism, and, at worst, they rely on a fundamental lack of basic human empathy, and none of them offer any substantive pushback against assisted suicide. Part 17. Notes and Acknowledgements Number 1. In The Remote Control Brain, the story goes on to explain how a new form of the electrode may be able to stave off Megan's depression in the future, which would, in this case, remove the need for assisted suicide. This is extremely lucky, but I think Megan's case still provides a clear example of the kind of situation where assisted suicide should be on the table. Number 2. Some people might take issue with my tone, but frankly, how measured of a tone is reasonable to expect in response to the idea that we need to force people to endure some of the worst possible suffering imaginable? I submit to you that the tone of this video has been reasonably proportional to the subject matter. Number 3. Some people might accuse me of arguing from emotion, using upsetting images and audio merely for shock value, in the same way that anti-abortion protesters will display bloody images of aborted fetuses. However, when it comes to assisted suicide, the entire argument is that it should be legal precisely because of the horrible suffering it prevents. Suffering is the key point. Whereas, in the debate around abortion, no one argues that because the operation is gross, therefore it should be illegal. That is the difference between shock value and relevant data. In the case of assisted suicide, the horrific suffering these people endure is the entire point of the argument. If you've made it to the end, thank you very much for watching.